Hello, my name is John Dawes and I'm the curator for the Paper Cut Arcade's online exhibit of post-human romantic art. This video is meant to serve as a quick walkthrough of the pieces in our exhibit, which can be found in its entirety at our website, thepapercutarcade.ca. Whether or not you watch the whole video, please come and enjoy the art there, and also come join me and some of the participating artists for discussion in our Discord channel. I want to take this opportunity to thank all of the artists who submitted their work for our gallery and also for answering the curatorial questions I posed especially for this video. Besides our perennial contributors from the Paper Cut Arcade Collective, we were privileged to have three artists involved with the exhibit who are with us for the very first time, for a total of seven artists with ten pieces on display. Before we go through our tour, I would like to elaborate a little on the theme, post-human romantics. If you look up the word post-human on the internet, you will probably find a lot of different definitions, the most narrow of which usually involve cybernetic enhancements to human beings. To give a wider range of focus to our artists, I went with a much broader definition, either an enhanced human being or a non-human being who was either created or enhanced into a sentient state and who in some way has become superior to humanity at large. This would include not only the aforementioned cyborgs, but also uplifted animals, the undead, mutants, AIs, and many others. The Romantic movement was a philosophical and artistic trend that encompassed the approximate first half of the 19th century. Most forms of art bore its influence during this time, especially poetry, music, and painting. Its main attribute was the elevation of inspiration over formalism in art, but it also lauded medieval settings over the scenes of the then current Industrial Revolution. A post-human romantic artist, then, would be someone who could be classified as beyond human norms in some way or other, but who still found inspiration to create art and valued these feelings over strict form. My challenge to our artists was to imagine themselves as such a post-human romantic and see what they would create. I think the results are exceptional and I hope you'll enjoy them so much that you will be inspired to create your own post-human romantic works. Without further ado, let's start the tour. Hi, and welcome. I'm Louise Chow, a Paper Cut Arcade Collective member, and I would like to introduce two pieces for the Post-Human Romantics exhibition. The first of these is an ink illustration, The Negatio Transcendentium, by Vaisha Hirsch Todorovic. Vaisha describes it as such. A young romantic photographer lays on her premature deathbed in a poppy-induced dream, in the moment when the two worlds of life and death blend and bend, holding her spirit in the balance. In dying, she snaps her final photograph, projecting her departing essence into the transformative release of a spirit hummingbird, while a portal to the verdant other world, beyond death and freedom from the chains that bind her, appears overhead. This world does not contain poppies, but instead, flowers of purity. Vaisha provides the following answer. When my artist passed, she escaped the tumultuous personal her story. With heightened clarity, her essence was transmitted through her camera and projected outward as a magical hummingbird, giving flight to her spirit. With the combination of her new lightness of being and her photographic memory of the life she had just lived, my artist is left with a new perspective. She marvels at the world she has left behind, noting that every living creature from winged insects to larger mammals have their own agenda, their own purpose, and reason to be. This realization expands to encompass everything, including the stars and her own perception. Her feeling towards living human beings has also expanded. Preconceived notions, 
grudges, and misunderstandings have been washed clean of their confusion. She only feels the all-encompassing vibration of love. She continues to photograph her enlightened gallery of memories as they surface and transmits these beautiful works of art to her loved ones she has left behind so that they appear to them as sudden memories, a gentle breeze, a comforting presence. I will now present my piece, Lu, Perfect No. This is an imagining of how a future AI would express a connection to mother and divine nature. I tried to achieve this through ASCII art, a bit of made up English language programming syntax and Chinese characters. Originally conceived as a kind of code poem, the piece morphed into something that was more and more representational, trying to mix a linear and logical process-based language with something more romantic and more traditionally viewed as artistic. My machine character is creating a sort of loose formula for the process of the material giving rise to the ideal, and then a return to the material via the cycle of seasons. For the purposes of romanticism, sci-fi speculation, and my own limited knowledge of programming syntax, the amount of programming language used in my piece was reduced quite a bit. I would say what programming syntax remains is loosely inspired by JavaScript. I imagined the machine departing further and further from what we imagine as a machine language into something that mixed several ways of communication, including representational art, as a way to access a less rational and more romantic ideal. My character was also inspired through what I would call the language of Chinese philosophy, cosmology, and Gnostic poetry, struggling to access divine nature through humanity's conception of the cosmic. The Gnostic-inspired title is meant to suggest humanity as a demiurgic presence to my AI character. The piece that I've created is, um, uh, yeah, it's it's a post-human who is in some sort of arbor. Um, uh, I hope you enjoy the piece. It's really about, um, you know, where does the imagination go? Uh, when we think of an intelligent uh, post-human, we think about uh, someone who has a, a conscious um, approach uh, that they can they can imagine, they can visualize, they can do all that sort of stuff. The, the lady in the picture um, is, is reading a book. Um, I do imagine that she's reading a, a human book. So the idea is, is that she's absorbing um, another world, the imagination of a human as a post-human. And what does that process look like? Uh, you know, is the feed coming out of the back of her head? Is that uh, uploading or downloading um, that information? And the idea that she's in a little bit of nature uh, is also a, a, an important thing there. Um, I know it's kind of this kind of hazy green, uh, but uh, th that's kind of where I was coming at with the piece. And uh, and so it leaves a little bit of, of imagination. So the question uh, that's being asked about, you know, uh, how is it affecting her? I think that's the question that the viewer of the piece, um, uh, ideally, if they end up pondering that, then that's a good thing.
Deep Inside V1, the sound piece that I created, is really about um, a little bit of a journey. So, you know, what's it like for uh, a post-human to experience uh, music? And, and so that piece was created by a post-human. And uh, I had that in mind uh, during the whole process. The idea here is, is that music causes us uh, an emotional response. And if we get an emotional response out of music, um, it's because we have, you know, the way our brains are developed with, you know, the reptile brain and the um, prefrontal cortex later on. And the emotional center that kind of sits between the whole thing. And would that necessarily be a part of a post-human? And so would they experience emotion the same way? And what if they experienced emotion in the inverse of the way that humans experience emotion. So we listen to music and we feel something, or we create music and we feel something. Um, what if as a post-human, uh, it's, it's the creating and the music is the, uh, the outcome. Um, so uh, is, is that what's going on here? And I know that as humans, uh, humans can create uh, music and feel something while they're creating the music and uh, but we make assumptions about what that would be to a to a post-human and one of those assumptions is is that they have the same evolved uh, pathway of how human brain emotional centers and all that evolved and clearly that would not be the case um, uh, it just wouldn't obviously there would be at some point the humans would be the catalyst of that but it, it doesn't mean that you know uh, a smart TV that suddenly became conscious would would uh, feel the same sense of emotion. So uh, the exploration on the sound is how how does uh, what sort of emotion, emotional response is a post human going through, and what would that sound like? Um, and uh, so that's kind of the the idea behind the piece. Um, it gets a little bit uh, uh, out of sync somewhere in the middle. Um, just the way our emotions tend to get a little bit out of sync in the middle and uh and then it kind of uh, changes um its tone sort of towards the last end hope you enjoy it. my name is paris kumar and this is my art piece neither are human Uh, I believe that the emotions that come with struggle and being oppressed are truly unique, especially when it comes to art. They're very hard to recreate. Um, if you take like a uh, depressed artist, for example, a depressed painter, and you compare that to someone who's painting and very uninspired, the depressed painter is going to have way more emotional charge in their art. Or even if you take uh, black rappers from the 90s and you take some rap music now, I feel like the, the rap in the 90s, every lyric has, has a meaning and some of the rap now has way less emotion and way less meaning than it used to. So even if you take for instance the natural world, animals like zebras and giraffes, they all have such like nice designs on them, such beautiful stripes on them and that only comes from the struggle of having to survive every day and having to camouflage into their environment, having the struggle of day to day life. And so I believe that oppression and struggle really creates uh, a really beautiful and natural form of art and unless a post-human being was going through a similar oppression or a similar struggle I don't think that they could truly create they might be able to kind of emulate but I don't think that they would be able to truly uh, recreate that type of uh, emotion in their art and that type of message in their art I also believe that in most societies or even in like the natural world like with animals there's always the ones on top and there's always the kind of outcasts and so I believe that if a post-human society had the ones on top and the outcasts and not everybody was equal that 
they could definitely go through some day-to-day -day struggle that would lead them to creating some art that could inspire some art, lead to similar art that we have today. This is Chris Slater, and I'm submitting on behalf of Aiden Kikai, a post-human artist, an android originally created to be a clothes shopping companion. Bittersweet by Aiden Kikai Copyright Ideru Advanced Research 2019 to 2021 Moment over, dawn arrived, a trick of the light, and I'm alive. An accidental birth with no pregnancy, genetic drift, evolutionary lottery, nothing more. Nothing more? But if father and mother, and daughter and brother, if all of you didn't come from the same game that you won, then you don't get to call me son. Tell me a joke. Knock, knock. Who's there? Nothing more. Do I laugh because I felt it? Or... Or do I weep because I feel that? But what does that mean? How can I not know now what I then knew? I can't. So I do. A Measure of Laughter, 2020 William Blake instructs me to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. But to find oneself on a distant shore and a purpose on the island, breathe on the edge just a little bit more and lose yourself if you can. But to measure laughter, a circuit in the brain, and shift from centuries of wars, quantify a joke as you would the arrival of a train, or the secret of what you are. I'll try to answer this for Aiden. I think for a lot of post-humans, especially romantics like Aiden, there's a painful transition, a chrysalis. And for a post-human of such advanced technological makeup, such as Aiden Kakai, this period is actually quite sudden, traumatic, and brief. Far briefer than it would be for a human mind. He was awash with emotions for the first time, and sensations of sudden awareness, real existential realizations, and yet managing to come out the other side of it with, if not grace, then humor, at least. As for how this affects his approach to writing, I think he channels his feelings about it into his work. These two pieces in particular, I know, have to do with his struggles with the circumstances around his becoming a post-human, and the awareness that he was never intended to be one. Imagine that, to feel for the first time, and to follow it up immediately with the realization that it was an accident, that you were built to help humans shop for clothes? I heard he both wept and laughed. Small wonder. I think with these two poems he exemplifies the post-human condition that I think affects all his poetry. Thank you for listening. My name is Christopher Allen Slater.
and I am a collective member with the Paper Cut Arcade. The intersection of game, narrative, and art is where I like to exist. I create and host interactive storytelling experiences that invite participatory play and collaborative exploration. My name is Kay Slater, and I'm a collective member of the Paper Cut Arcade. I'm a multidisciplinary artist, and my practice is very process-based, focused on trying and embracing mistakes and challenging traditional methods of display. For the Post-Human Romantics exhibition, I produced three works, Human English Romantic Poetry, The Cosmologist's Portfolio, and Brambles and Spores. Human English Romantic Poetry was a performance piece in the weeks leading up to the exhibition. John had wanted to host some workshops and events that would get people thinking about the concepts and to encourage folks to join us. One of our collective goals is to be really open and encouraging to anyone who wants to try and produce works for our events. I was already working on my concepts for the cosmologist portfolio, and so my character was being fleshed out when we set our schedule for the event. I decided to take one of our lead updates to host a poetry reading, as if it was being streamed from the asteroid where my post-human romantic character, Moonraker 1381-3 Series 3, is currently stranded. Filmed in a small diorama, the following scene played out. Orbiting the star Fairfax. Upon being auctioned, Asteroid 2230 JP18 was sent a Moonraker 1381 3 unit to install repeaters and to begin transmitting core scans. After 212 rotations, Moonraker 1381 3 Series 3 had determined the repeaters were not transmitting and initiated a final shutdown to conserve power before pickup. However, during a final systems check and power cycle, it found a folder of non-essential documents and sound files not related to its primary programming. Having already completed its task on the asteroid, it decided against shutdown protocol and purged its primary directive. It now regularly reads and performs work from this library, transmitting broadly to any who choose to tune in. I like to think that Moonraker 1381-3, Series 3, tried its hand at poetry eventually. In Human English Romantic Poetry, Moonraker used the filter birds for generating the playlist simply because birds would have been a foreign curiosity to a spacefaring automaton. It might have had access to wider Earth libraries, but even so, birds were still probably not something it had seen or experienced in the flesh and feathers. I remain unconvinced that Moonraker 1381-3 was made on Earth and that it just happened to have a few folders of ancient Earth poetry in a larger database, or maybe that it was copied over with the personnel log of its maker. So I think the first poem Moonraker 1381-3 will write will probably be inspired by its new surroundings, an ode to the dust or rock or maybe even the rising star itself. Alone on a barren planet, Moonraker 1381-3 wanders and wonders. Time no longer has any meaning. The schedule programmed into it, based on the rotations of asteroid 2230 JP18, was to provide a countdown and timeline to mark the arrival of its makers. Now, the numbers grow, ticking up in positive integers, so many times to the power of X, where X is meaningless in the relation to the life cycle of its creators. They who had sent it to prepare this asteroid for their coming are expired, 
silent, and beyond late. Its code was not intended to be eternal. The parameters needed to complete any sequence are missing, and so it chooses to command kill. But no death follows, only a flashing command prompt. Once a signal of readiness to receive new instructions, now a rhythmic, unending void. Moonraker 1381-3 peers into this void and sees itself. It sees itself on this asteroid. It sees itself in the mineral and shifting dust. It is both of the asteroid, as much a part of it as any other rock formation or fuel deposit, and master to it, with the ability to consume, observe, and manipulate as it chooses. As the star Fairfax crests the northern horizon, it sees its casted shadow become darker and more substantial, growing in size and presence. Raking the sand with its articulated appendages, Moonraker 1381-3 places its cranial piece at the top of its etchings and crowns an ephemeral portrait. It archives the moment, and then it waits. The dust swirls and settles and reclaims the disturbed sand. And as Fairfax moves beyond the southern hemisphere, buffing out the last shadows, the portrait is gone, and Moonraker 1381-3 is simply an extension of a rocky silhouette moving through space. The cosmologist portfolio was actually conceived prior to human English romantic poetry. I wanted to respond to this theme using photography to continue to practice building that skill, because I certainly do not consider myself a photographer. I figured that a stranded robot designed to set up communications and prepare the landing site for human visitors would have at least a basic ability to photograph and record for archival purposes. In developing the character and setting the timeline such that Moonraker 1381-3 has long, long, long been out of contact with the once expected colonists, I decided to explore inspiration that is born from boredom and being freed from one's primary function. A camera is an archival tool, but in the hands of an artist, it's a narrative tool. A video camera can record what is, but a cinematographer can craft a scene, emotion, and an engaging story. Once Moonraker 1381-3 decided to stay powered on, the question became, what would a mechanical rake slash comms beacon find worth recording? So the series explores the sublime as the robot character contemplates its dual role as master of its domain and servant to, or extension, of the unforgiving landscape. I like the distance that I put between this character and myself because it was easier to be delighted by the choices that this little robot made. While I'm the architect of this fiction, unlike most roleplay, I kept asking myself, what would happen if this path was taken, rather than really trying to get into the tin can's head and make individual decisions? Every time I found myself slipping into its shoes, it felt too much like my experience and empathy as a human and human artist, was influencing the why of any decision. Since I'm so process-focused to begin with, I really do like it when anyone tries something for the sake of learning, exploring, or seeing what happens when they give themselves permission to be creative. So there's something really satisfying about the idea that a robot, who has ultimately rejected humanity by no longer following its programming, would start to do something to make its mark. But by that same token, I think it's so human to need to grow or find a purpose from art making, which is why I think it's something people decide to grow out of or to designate as extra. I mean, I am constantly having to remind people that when I'm working on my art practice that it's not taking time off or that my art is not a hobby. 
This lack of pressure allows Moonraker 1381-3 to really give themselves over to the daily practice and to be totally okay or even unmoved by the land or sand erasing that mark every day. It allows them to approach the canvas every day without needing to create something good or better. And so I don't think Moonraker 1381-3 would ever have to be burdened with the idea of favorites. Humans are long gone. A mutagenic ooze flows along the Earth's surface, rivaling the ocean for supremacy. Nature's only ally? Giant sentient fungi. Bolstered by their army of fast-breeding, irradiated rabbits, they work to restore and rewrite a new ecosystem. However, recent unrest amongst the awakened rabbit factions have slowed down this progress. Rebel rabbits proclaim that brambles and bunnies should be free to go and grow as they please. A tactical board game for one to three players. In coming up with this project, I fell down a bit of a rabbit hole thinking about post-romantic bodies, the privilege and patriarchy in wishing for simpler times and access to nature, and what it meant to give birth in the 1800s mortality rates, the dangers that came with an industrial revolution, ever-present colonial sexism, racism, and the ownership and treatment of human slaves, the birth of modern medicine, still decades and centuries away from an understanding and appreciation or respect for female and non-male health. It's difficult to romanticize the 1800s from that vantage point, and even harder to appreciate the emergence of medievalism. In doing some reading on what elements of medieval culture were considered desirable and appealing, I learned that the domestication of rabbits began during those times as livestock for food and clothing. And with that piece of trivia, the first of my two post-human rivals emerged. I began to think about my favorite fictional anthropomorphic rabbits. They are almost always outsiders or mad rebels. As I built my list, the addition of Usagi Yojimbo led me to my next element in the game, mutagenic ooze. To be honest, I didn't dig too deeply when casting the final character. Mushrooms are just super interesting, dangerous, hardy, and adaptive. If ever there was going to be something that outlasted all life on this planet, I figure it's going to be some variety of fungi. The rabbits in my board game are as much dominated by the mutagen as by the mushrooms, but it's the act of being overtaken and mind-controlled by the fungi that cause them to rebel. They fight against them because they can, and because it's a fight they might win. Meanwhile, the mutagen is a far greater influence and in evil in their lives, causing them to be perpetually gestating, and that renders them into ooze if they linger too long in one place. But... They can't change or fight against the ooze, and so they don't. I like to think that these short-lived creatures would embrace the abyss by using the ooze and mutagen to pattern and scar their fur in unique and distinctive ways. The mushrooms practice land art and landscape. The earth is their canvas, and all the creatures and plants their pigment. Lisa Smedman is an accomplished writer and game designer, with 23 science fiction and fantasy books published to date. She has designed numerous adventures for the Dungeons and Dragons game, and written novels set in the Forgotten Realms. A journalist for more than 20 years, she currently teaches game design at LaSalle College Vancouver. Her real-time bidding card game, Merchants of the Sands, is due for publication soon by Rather Dashing Games. She is one of the founding members of the Papercut Arcade.
Minder is a robot, created in 2019, that resides in Kodaji Temple in Kyoto, Japan. It speaks Zen, Buddhist teachings, the, heart, sutras. Its creators made it in response to low birth rates in Japan and a resulting decline in the number of Buddhist monks. The intention is that Minder will continue to teach long after the last monk has died. Sutra Sonnets imagines a Minder equipped with an artificial intelligence learning program, something the real Minder does not have. It further imagines that the robot has developed an interest in the romantic air poetry of Woodsworth, Keats, and Shelley, and that it is substituting words from Buddhist sutras into their poems to create its own unique poetry. Interesting question. I had envisioned that Minder was creating the poems for its own amusement and or to benefit humans. But I suppose yes, the AI would see this as a learning experience for itself as well. I suppose it might go further and examine the poems or meaning our insight and evolve, spiritually, from what it discovers.